What a Sunday night I just had watching Doctor Sleep. Oh my God. I mean, I was saying like, I don't really get scared watching movies, but watching Rebecca Ferguson especially, yeah. there's like a fear that you feel watching her. She approached that character in a way I thought was genius, which was that, you know, I'm looking at Rose the Hat saying, this is one of the best antagonists I've seen in the King book in a very long time. And she's looking at these horrible things she has to do in the movie um, and trying to figure out how to do them. And she talked to me in prep and said, you know, I think the way through this is I have to just decide she's not the monster of the movie. She's the hero of the story. Mm -hmm. um, and she's doing these horrible things to protect her family. And the monsters are Dan and Abra who show up and try to kill her family. Right. Uh, and once she'd rationalized all these things, um, it made the performance, I think, so much more chilling. Uh, just, and something awesome. about like the charm where you're just like... Yeah, you're like, you, you love her. You love her. Yeah. Yes. Um, yeah. Can you talk a little bit about your history with Stephen King? I know you're a big yeah. fan. Yeah. You go from reading him as a as a as a kid. As a kid. Uh, yeah. I I started reading Stephen King way way before I was old enough to read Stephen King, and um, it completely shaped kind of everything I, I think about uh, what the genre can do, what horror fiction should do, um, the importance of character, kind of this this worldview that sees the world as this very dark and treacherous, dangerous place full of mystery, but that also, um, as a counterbalance to that, can kind of show ordinary people at their best. Um, and, and so yeah, Stephen King has been my hero since I was a kid. And this is the second time I've been lucky enough to kind of play in his sandbox. Right. Yeah. So you're like, you know, doing interviews beside him. He's tweeting support of this film. I also mean, crazy. Yeah. What does that mean to you? Oh, it's, 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 I still make the same weird noise whenever it happens. Cause I, I'll, I follow him on Twitter and I'll just look down and see something kind of pop up in my feed. Yeah. And I'll just make He's this He's just like tweeting squeak. your name. Yeah. It's, <laughs> you know, it's, uh, it's, it's, it's still completely surreal. And you know, I, I'm a fan first. Before before I was ever able to make films, you know, um, which I'm still every day. I'm just lucky that that's the way my life worked out. Mm -hmm. I spent you know my whole life just being a rabid fan, and so I react that way first. You know. Well, he like yeah. pretty inf infamously dunked on the Shining movie. Yes. So what kind of conversations did you two have? Because you're kind of combining both of those elements of his work and and the Kubrick film. Which I, I knew would be a really tough sell for him. Yeah. Um, in the beginning, when, when we were developing the, the script, you know, I, I said, well, this is what I, I think I should do. I think there's only one way to make this movie, and that's to acknowledge kind of the cinematic impact of Kubrick's film. That's the language that everybody knows when they think of the Overlook and the Torrances. This could be a real chance to celebrate that. Um, but it also could be a really wonderful opportunity to take those two visions, which, you know, still to this day is something that he has very strong feelings about, and try to bring them back together a little bit. You know, mm -hmm. Try to reconcile them, even even if only a little, um, and that as as a fan was was a an irresistible opportunity. Um, he, after he kind of heard me out, and and heard how I would approach it and why I wanted to do it that way, he gave his blessing um, to do that before I went to write the script. And if he hadn't uh, given me his blessing, I wouldn't have made the film. And did you do high pitch noise? Yeah. <laughs> yeah no, well, well, then, then I just started making this kind of strangled, stressed out noise um, <laughs> yeah. that that has lasted every day, kind of up up to now, really. Um, I mean, I can imagine. Yeah. I mean, there's there's certain elements where I was like, I mean, it, it can't. It's got to be a lot of pressure to kind of recast the Shelley Duvall, Jack Nicholson roles and have people in there. It's been the most intimidating project, and and, and for actors. You know, like Alex Esso, who plays Wendy, and, and Carl Lumley, who plays Dick Haller, and you know, the, the pressure on them, mm -hmm. too. You know, there, there was a sense with all of us, of like, oh my God, we're, we're stepping into these monolithic shadows, and um, any move we make is going to be scrutinized. Kind of every decision is going to be triple guessed. Um, we have to be really um, as respectful as possible. And, and we all looked at this as, as a celebration of The Shining, more yeah. than a sequel. You know, it, I've loved to look at it as a descendant in that it it has the DNA of its parents, you know, and the parents are Kubrick and King. Yeah. But it still has to kind of find its own identity, and, and we all looked at it that way. Did so. you use any footage from the original Shining, or were you recreating pretty much? Uh, there are three shots um, that are Kubrick's shots. Uh, the shot of the island in the canyon, and the two shots after with the car driving up the mountain. Okay. Those are his shots. We changed them to nighttime and added snow, and we changed out the car. 
um, but all the rest is recreation. So did you redo the blood elevator? Yes. Wow. Yes. Uh, so when the teaser trailer came out, um, because someone had asked, and I said, actually, that's the only shot in the teaser trailer that, that is Kubrick's. At the time, it was, because ours wasn't finished yet. Wow. Uh, but now it has been finished, and, and the, the elevator shot that's in the film is, is ours.